Good evening and welcome to The Squawk. I'm Carson Snitzler. And I'm Guy Bits II. Tonight, we hear from Jay Grote as he discusses AI and its benefits and drawbacks. And we also check in on the Northeast Jazz Fest. And we're taking a road trip and we're not quite sure if it's going to really end well. Stick around for all this and more on The Squawk. Norfolk, Nebraska has a population of almost 25,000 and is a great place to live. Not many people know much about the city they go to college in, so let's take a deep dive around this amazing community. In Norfolk, Nebraska, a tight-knit community thrives amidst the vast cornfields and rolling plains. One of its most compelling stories revolves around the Johnson family. The Johnsons moved to Norfolk seeking a peaceful, family-friendly environment to raise their children. In Norfolk, they found a place where neighbors became lifelong friends and community support is unwavering. When their youngest child, Lily, was diagnosed with a rare medical condition, the Johnsons were overwhelmed with the outpouring of support from the community. Neighbors organized fundraisers, cooked meals, and offered emotional support, easing the burden on the family during a challenging time. Norfolk's strong sense of community extends beyond personal crises. The Johnson children thrived in Norfolk schools where teachers are dedicated to their students' success. The schools offer a wide range of extracurricular activities from sports to arts, providing a well-rounded education. Norfolk's proximity to nature also benefits the Johnsons. Weekends are spent exploring the nearby parks, fishing in the Elkhorn River, or hiking along the Cowboy Trail. The family enjoys the simple pleasures of small town life, where traffic jams are unheard of and the pace is relaxed. Despite its small size, Norfolk offers a surprising array of amenities. The town boasts a vibrant downtown with locally owned shops and restaurants. Cultural opportunities abound with community theater productions, art galleries, and live music performances. For the Johnson family, Norfolk, Nebraska has offered more than just a place to live. It's provided a supportive community, excellent schools, and a high quality of life. It's a place they're proud to call home. So the story you just saw was actually fully generated by AI, or artificial intelligence. And so here to talk about artificial intelligence with me is Jay Grote. He is a part of the IT department as a systems manager. And Jay, so AI has been around for a little while, but it's really expanded recently. Do you talk about what kind of led to the big expansion of AI? Appreciate it. Carson, thank you so much for having me here on the Squawk today. So when it comes to artificial intelligence, right, there have actually been a lot of systems beforehand that have tried to be an expert in their field. So I went to school for computer um, information technology, management information systems. I got my bachelor's degree at Doan University. Yeah, yeah. And so as part of that, one of the areas that I had to study was what systems are implemented in business. And recently it seems like AI came out of nowhere, but AI has actually been a lot of work for generations in order to make people's lives easier, make better decisions, get data, and collate and present data in better ways. One of the systems that I looked at pretty closely was called an expert system where you actually interviewed an expert as part of a developer, you interviewed an expert, and then you would sell that to businesses as like a consultant that you could ask about uh, questions or have it present data that's relevant to your industry. Lots of companies have been involved in something like that. I mean, if you look around, IBM has been in computers ever since forever. I mean, IBM is synonymous with being the computer um, company, at least in the United States. And one of their AI systems was Watson. And Watson actually got very good at understanding natural language and then sorting and ingesting lots of information in order to play the TV game Jeopardy. 
So that's just a brief history of where artificial intelligence has come in. And in terms of business, it's all coming down from how can we uh, supplement the workforce. So that's just my brief intro. So what do you think are, I'm gonna kind of get specifically to the college campus since that's our audience. Where do you see as some of the benefits and even some of the drawbacks when it comes to AI when used on college campuses? So on college campuses, I think we're starting to realize creatively where AI can have a place. Um, you know, at least from your guys' package presentation of the video here, it was entirely fabricated. The Johnsons are not a real family. There might be people out there with the name Johnson. They might have gone through a situation similar to what the artificial intelligence wrote for that video story. But I got a chance to preview that and I noticed that, okay, we're only seeing B-roll. B-roll is a video term where we're not seeing the actual subject of the story. B-roll is just filler footage in order to keep pixels moving on the video or rays on a cathode ray tube. Anyway, I'm getting kind of crazy off into the technology for broadcast. Can you tell I, I studied broadcast in college as well? Anyway, on the college campus, artificial intelligence presents great ways for people to get engaged with learning, but you have to be very careful and diligent and fact check about it. When I got first access to um, ChatGPT, that is just one artificial intelligence that happens to be online, there's many others. But when I first got access to it, I started playing around with, okay, what does it know for facts? What does it know for recent events? Can I trick it into believing something? Can it correct me? Um, and there are some areas that I started exploring and I realized, okay, chat GPT as an AI is very confident, but it can also be confidently wrong. And so when you start to think about that from an educational perspective, at least in the area of higher ed, what does that mean? What does that benefit us for? Maybe it can be the solution that gets a student or an instructor or a staff member out of what's called writer's block. I find myself in that a lot because you know I wanna get started on something and I just need something to get me creatively moving in the right direction. And I find that ChatGPT is an excellent resource in order to get me out of creative block, writer's block anyway. And so I know that I have a good brain. I know that I can think uh, critically. But if I'm having issues getting started, I know that that's not beneficial for how I should be spending my time. On the college campus, what we should be looking at is where is it appropriate to use? How do we tell people what's appropriate use for it? And then what comes into the ethical and legal implications of it? ChatGPT and many other languages were trained on data which we don't know exactly where it came from. Like possibly ChatGPT has read all these books. Well, now we have to ask ourselves a question. If ChatGPT is giving information from these books, is it citing the sources? Do the writers and authors of these books get royalties for some of the information that ChatGPT is giving out? And we've already started to see some legal implications of that as well. And there are writer strikes that happen in Hollywood because they don't want their content being scanned by AI. And rightfully so. They work very hard to make creative content, and that's why they went on strike in Hollywood, among many other reasons. But it comes down to can you control what uh, an AI is going to scan, regurgitate, and if it's going to do that, how do you compensate the people that helped develop it? So that's just my quick overview on that. Well, some very, very great insight, Jay. We thank you very much for coming in and giving us just a little bit more information on AI and how to deal with it. And we're going to take a short break, but don't go anywhere because we got a lot more coming up here on The Squawk. If you are struggling with any classes, we can help. Northeast Community College offers tutoring services for all students in all classes. The fourth week of the semester started Monday, January 29th, and that means all tutoring services, including the writing and math centers, as well as the athletic study tables, are in full swing. If you fall behind in any of your classes, talk to academic support to help you find a tutor. 
test taking skills, and study habits are covered after the sixth week. Once the ninth week begins, midterms have been completed and your grades will be submitted. This is a good time to monitor your progress in classes and a good time to get help if needed. Once the semester reaches the 11th week, time is running out, but you still have a chance to get your grades in a good spot. Finally, as the 15th week begins, it's time to start studying for finals and wrap up the year the right way. If you need any tutoring, talk to Matt at matthewch at northeast.edu. Welcome back to the squad. So, Guy, we just talked a little bit about AI. Yep. Have you used AI at all yourself, or have you had any experience with it? Um, a lot of times in my high school days, when I didn't feel like writing a paper, straight to chat GPT. Uh, but very quickly, teachers caught on to what was AI and not, yeah. because they chat GPT always used bigger words than I was capable of using. <laughs> so. Did yeah. you find it very useful at all? I found it useful full, kind of when I got to college a little bit because a lot of these classes uh, kind of want like need a quick script, so I just go on there and to get a quick script sometimes. All right, I'm putting you on the spot while Dr. Sevening's in here. You ever use it for Dr. Sevening's classes? No, but I will <laughs> say I have used it for a lot of Dolezal's classes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good to know. But now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about the sports news. Uh, Northeast Baseball picked up a big win, a big couple wins over the weekend. They had a series with Southeastern Community College, mm -hmm. who was ranked number six nationally. Northeast came in with two out of three games over the weekend. And this week in the polls, it just came out this morning, the Hawks had received a few votes in the national rankings. That's great on the Hawks. I feel like uh, the coach for the Hawks is doing an excellent job with the players that they have this year and using every available talent that they have on their team. Absolutely, and it's a big week for Hawks athletics as both baseball and softball will be at home. Yep. I believe there are games, if I'm not mistaken, every day between Wednesday and I believe Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. And mm -hmm. so... Come on down, the men, the baseball team plays over at Veterans Memorial Field, so come on down and see them. The softball team is at Tahazuka on the south side of town, so come down and watch them play, and if you can't make it to any of the games, be sure to tune in to the Hawk Sports Network, and we will have all of your coverage on those games, and I know I've done a few games, and Guy has done a few games, and I think we both have kind of enjoyed oh, our yeah. time down there at the games. Yeah, they Northeast knows how to put on a show for the baseball and softball. Every time I go down there, I enjoy every second of it. I see a lot of talent out there. Absolutely, it's a lot of great, it's a lot of great athletes down there. Their coaches do a lot of great recruiting. It's just a lot of fun to be down at the athletic events. Absolutely, like you said, their coaches do a lot of great recruiting. Uh, a few of the guys I played baseball against uh, okay. during. Uh, Le my Legion days. Uh, some of the guys are from uh, Cairo and Dana, Brock, Nebraska, and so I know a few of them, and they are able to put on some talent. So yeah, like we said, we have a few games coming this week. Come check them out or tune in to our coverage, and with that, we got another short break. We got much more coming up. Don't go anywhere. Your face is an image I can't shake, no matter how I beg. Kiss a hundred girls and love but Place. Do they even say for your taste? And only with you I do break my rules. I've been sleeping in later than I'm used to now. I've been scrolling through my phone, waiting for you to respond. I've been getting a little out of hand sometimes. Just might get a little wet By the end of the night A little rain, a little rain Come down on me A little rain, a little rain Come down on me Welcome back to the Squawk. Yesterday and today, Northeast hosted its annual Jazz Fest. So with that, we sent special correspondent Connor Haig to check out the event. 
Can you describe the Jazz Festival for me? Certainly. It's a, it's a really a contest where we have, um, oh, roughly on a good year, about 1,500 students that show up, say maybe 50, 60 schools, and uh, they will bring their um, show choirs, their jazz choirs, their jazz ensembles, and they'll be judged uh, on a, uh, two, two ways. They'll be judged either, we'll rank them one, two, three, uh, but they also are ranked against each other, so like a bar. So, you know, you, every group could get a one, and you still have a first and a second place, or everybody could, group could get a four, and you still have a first and a second. It was begun in 1982 by an adult group called the Northeast Area Jazz Ensemble, and they wanted to establish this group so that, or this festival, I should say, so that it promoted jazz education in Northeast Nebraska and the surrounding areas. So we have schools from Kansas, um, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska. Students are working the different rooms. So here is the, uh, the warm up room. Mm. Right now there's no schools here because of the weather. Um, so I just started my shift, but we help people get in and out of the rooms certain times, um, certain slots for different schools. Um, so the judges make recordings on these recorders. It's my job to take the SD card out of the recorders and send it to the computer room so that the teams can look at them later. So what was the plan? So I get to be doubly involved because I'm part of the Northeast Area Jazz Ensemble that hosts this as well. So of course I'm going to say that it's a well-ran. Um, function and I think our kids have a good time and it's just a good thing for our kids to be at. I think it's a really great opportunity for us students to see all the great bands in high school that come here and perform and I think it gives us a good opportunity to show our work ethic as well. It's pretty good. I really like it besides the terrible weather. That kind of sucks. You up for some karaoke? <laughs> karaoke. You heard of the song House of the Rising Sun? Yeah. If you want to do some karaoke? Yeah, sure. House of the Rising Sun? Can't see that. Yeah, just read the lyrics. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Only if you're singing with me. Oh, I got you. <laughs> what is this for? <laughs> there is a house in New <laughs> This time of year, some people may suffer from basketball addiction. One student took it a step too far and might need some serious help. As you can see, he's not the most skilled player. guy sucks. Uh, I think Tanner might legitimately be the worst basketball player I've ever seen in my 37 years of coaching. No skill, no talent, no hops, can't get buckets at all. Um, I, I think, mean, quite frankly, he's just delusional. Like, he, he, he'll be running around screaming something, something LeBron James. Yeah, yeah. He, he claims to be the second coming of Michael Jordan. LeBron James. I'd say I'm pretty addicted. I mean, this is one of the greatest sports I've ever played in my life, and I, I fully believe that I am the next LeBron James, besides not being LeBron James. I'm not really that delusional. 
I mean, I fully believe in my skills and my capabilities as an athlete in the sport. Can the decision to cut Tanner from the basketball team? As you can see, Tanner was angry about this decision and he decided to take out his anger on both of his coaches. I feel like I got a pretty good chance I'm making the draft this year. Probably get on the starting roster my love for the sport and my, I wouldn't say fully addiction, but some people like to call it an addiction. Um, I said I'm going to make it. Big, big, big time money, big all-star games coming up, so stay tuned. These college coaches, they don't know nothing. They can't guard me. They can't stop me from shooting the ball. All they can do is get in my way. How many times have you actually played, like been off the benches and like played in a game? It's my first year officially playing uh, off bench. Normally I start on bench, but now I'm my first year off bench. And I'm, I'm actually doing really good so far. So that's pretty good. Welcome back to the Squawk. I am here joined with Coach Aaron Sharp of the Northeast Softball. Uh, so, Aaron, uh, what has been the biggest obstacle taking on the the team in the same month of their opening day? Yeah, I think just like the hardest part is just really not knowing the girls, getting mm -hmm. to work with them during the fall. Yeah. Um, coming in blindly, I mean, you don't really know what they've worked on mm -hmm. um, and where they're at. I've tried to watch a little bit the first weekend just to kind of see where they were at, but mm -hmm. um, unfortunately it was just like live stats yeah. where you can't really critique oh, yeah. swings and everything that way. What are some of the team's strengths so far that you've seen uh, through, from the players, like some of the strong points that, they have, that you have focused on for the players and for the team as well? Like some of, just some of their strong points. Yeah, I think um, they're doing really well at just playing as a team, mm -hmm. um, being there as a team. Obviously, when we have a couple girls who have come from different sports and yep. a couple girls that we just had to pick up, uh, that's really hard to do and be in that same culture as team-wise, and mm -hmm. I think they've been really, really good at that part. After the opening week, what did you realize like the team needed to work on the most? Uh, definitely uh, defense. Um, we have a lot of girls out of possession or mm -hmm. positions right now, so just getting them in the right position, finding out who works best with who by them sides, and then going from there. I think our offense was and has been really solid. I uh, just got to keep working off of that. That's one question I was going to ask too. Just kind of like, like if you were going to move any like outfielders more to the infield, just to kind of get them to used to trying to get possession of the ball and stuff. Yeah, um, I think our outfield and our infield are pretty set. 
stat wise. Um, I think the minor tweaks that we have are kind of like shortstop and mm -hmm. second base, just trying to find out who's can cover more ground in the middle. And then um, only having one pitcher, it's kind of hard, right? We're trying to really work on trying to find new pitchers yeah. that can get us some innings by oh, some yeah. time. Now, what has been the biggest challenge of getting to know your players and coaching staff ju just because you came in on sh such a short time? Um, I mean, being the only coach, it's been kind of easy, honestly. Yeah. Just, I mean, so much time with such a small squad too, right? You, you kind of don't have a lot of girls to get to know. Oh, yeah. So um, I think just the road trips and everything has definitely helped. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the hardest part of all that, though, is trying to learn what works best for them, like mm -hmm. coaching style. Yes. And going into coaching style, as a former collegiate softball player, uh, going into coaching, what things, good and bad, have you learned from some of your former coaches that makes you the kind of coach uh, you are and the kind of coach that you want to be? Um, so being as a collegiate player and then going into coaching, I think I was really blessed with coaches who mm. really cared about culture yes. rather than winning. And um, I think that's kind of one thing that I've really mm -hmm. kind of stuck by is building that culture, that foundation to go into um, success further on down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, co different coaches can make uh, s playing very different. So, Carson? So, Coach, since uh, Guy once in a while, he has some problems kind of getting warm up and ready for the show, his mom's always kind of watching, and so she's always kind of worried about him. So can you kind of help Guy kind of get a little bit warmed up for the show a little bit? What are some kind of warm-ups that he can do? <laughs> yeah, so um, definitely, like, short hops, those just dailies, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> working on just a hand forward, your forehand, backhand, those do, type do of things. Do them? Oh. oh. Yes. <laughs> great. So what are we talking so about you're gonna here? you're going to be down on your knees. Knees? <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> yep. So you're going to go down the middle. So the main purpose here is to keep your hips at a hinge and keeping your chest out and over, right? So see how your hand is down here? Yeah. So that's just going to allow the ball to come up here. Yeah, so you have to have a flat hand, fingertips down, use it more as a wall, pushing okay. out towards. Push it through, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So, is that all we got? <laughs> we can catch Coach Sharp and the Hawks on Thursday. Uh, game, first game in a double header is at 2 o'clock over at Tahazuka. Actually, we're going to go play at Columbus. Oh, it's yep. It's now on the road. Yep. Okay, With it's weather. now a road game at Columbus. Yep. <laughs> we'll be right back here on the squawk. <laughs> Carson, when I talk about it, it just hurts. Since 21, my life's been numb. Living under the gun is no fun. You think that he's the only one that I know just begun. Love me. And I can't believe after everything you'd still fight for me. A lot of people don't understand what goes into a broadcast, and they don't understand what Carson does to get ready for a broadcast. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. It's intense. Mary had a little lamb. Give me a hunter on the Lakers. Yeah, a hundred. I'm good. You know I'm good for it. Yeah, just do it. Carson is multi-talented, and we're just really thankful he's here. Tonight, this show is for you. I love you, man. With me, and you'll be in a world of new imagination. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all we have for you tonight. We'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. We hope you've enjoyed the show as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. 
Special thanks, as always, to Tim Dietz of TC Home Furnishing for donating the couch. That guy is now modeling, I would say, for you right now. Tim has locations for TC here in Norfolk as well as in Humphrey for all of your furniture needs. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. Have a squawking good week, Hawks. Ah!